My book is published by a, uh, a division of Random House called Crown Forum, and it's uh, the same publisher of uh, Ann Coulter's books. And uh, they do great artwork. They did have a picture of uh, the Mayflower here, I guess, uh, coming on into a, into a, to a harbor. And I asked them though to put a picture of Ann Coulter in that rubber dress of hers, so I would sell more. But they they, they didn't think that would be appropriate uh, as far as that goes. But uh, I probably would have sold three or four times more had I done that. But the genesis of, of this book was uh, I didn't have any trouble getting it published because my publisher came to me, and it was at the time of the Enron scandal and all that, and, and uh, they were convinced that there'd be a new round of uh, bashing of capitalism. And uh, since they liked my my writing, they, they asked me to write a book that was sort of a popular defense of capitalism that draws on uh, mostly historical episodes of American capitalism. So that's what it was. I, I proposed the title Real Capitalism. Since I, since I wrote The Real Lincoln, I thought uh, Real Capitalism would be a follow-up. But they chose this title, How Capitalism Saved America, <clears throat> which I don't like that much, but they uh, they're the marketing pros. And so uh, it, it's aimed at a general audience, kind of like Tom Woods' book. It's uh, I picked a number of historical episodes. It's not a comprehensive economic history of America or anything of that sort. But uh, but one of the things that motivated me to, uh, to put the first chapter together is that it seems to me that uh, most Americans, uh, uh, apart from academics who, who hear the word capitalism, really think of mercantilism or sort of neo-mercantilism. They think of you know, all the deals that they read about in the paper, these cozy relationships between the defense contractor and the government or some, some, uh, Enron and the government, that's capitalism. But it's, you know, it's corporatism or mercantilism. It's something else. And so I thought I'd just lay out in as plain English as, as possible for me, uh, what capitalism is in the first chapter. And, uh, and relying, uh, heavily on, uh, the work of, uh, von Mises and Hayek and, uh, and Friedman and, and others, all, all the heroes of the, most of the people in this, uh, in this room, intellectual heroes. And then I wrote a chapter on anti-capitalism, uh, to talk about some of the reasons for anti-capitalism. Hayek has wrote a famous essay on this, uh, intellectuals, uh, and the socialism and the intellectuals, I think the name of it was. And then, of course, von Mises wrote the anti-capitalist mentality. And I quote those expen extensively and just talk about uh, mercantilists or neo-mercantilists as uh, opponents of capitalism also. Uh, the business, whole business class, uh, the business, American business people are capitalism's worst enemies for the, for the most part. And most people don't, don't seem to understand that. And so I thought it'd be useful to lay this all out uh, for a general audience. And it's been adopted uh, in a couple of universities, San Diego State, I just found out, has, has adopted it. And uh, uh, Karen DeCoster tells me Walsh College might be using it in, in a few other places. And so, uh, so, so about the bulk of the book is um, uh, I, I try to make it clearly written, but drawn on a lot of research that, that's been done by myself and other people and, and documented and footnoted uh, of case studies. And I start with um, the Pilgrims. And the real fascinating story of how the uh, the American pilgrims almost starved to death because they practice essentially collectivized agriculture. And once they introduce some kind of property rights, uh, that seems to have saved the day. I thought that would be a good starting point since property rights are the, the keystone of capitalism. And then <clears throat> I wrote about the capitalist aspects of the American Revolution, about how it was essentially, you know, partly anyway, an attempt by the King of England to uh, impose British mercantilism on the colonies to sort of uh, suck them dry of, through various taxes. That was not the whole reason, but that was part of it. And I think that that's underappreciated by most Americans. And I uh, you know, have a whole chapter on how the uh, capitalism enriched the working class. That's probably uh, uh, the most controversial among some, some of the critics that I've run across because it doesn't say <clears throat> that uh, prosperity has been caused exclusively by labor unions and government. And so I, I criticize that view, and that is the mainstream view of most Americans, that if it weren't for government regulation and labor unions would all be uh, uh, still be out there picking cotton 16 hours a day or so, something worse than, worse than that. Uh, the robber barons, uh, I have a chapter on the robber barons, and, uh, and uh, I could hardly improve on uh, Bert Folsom's work, and Tom uh, uh, addresses this too in his book. <clears throat> I think he has a nice division between the real capitalists who made their money by providing great goods and services and low prices versus uh, what he calls political entrepreneurs 
like Leland Stanford, for example, who uses political connections as governor of California and a U.S. senator to uh, have a law passed making it pretty much illegal to compete with him in the railroad business in California. And uh, even I could make money uh, if, there, if, ma if competition was illegal in, in business. And so, uh, like Folsom does, I, I, I wrote this chapter just trying to distinguish between the real crooks, the real robber barons, like Leland Stanford, and, uh, and uh, more of the free market entrepreneurs like James J. Hill, who built the Great Northern uh, Railroad. Uh, I've written a lot on antitrust over the years. I, wrote, uh, I have a chapter called The Antitrust Myth. And uh, I, uh, I first started writing about this in the early 80s in the academic journals. And I'm more convinced than ever that antitrust always was from the very beginning a protectionist racket and a fig leaf for protectionism. Uh, tariffs, fig leaf for, for tariffs. Uh, for example, uh, three months after the Sherman Act was passed, Sherman Antitrust Act was passed, um, uh, Senator John Sherman himself was the Senate sponsor of the McKinley Tariff Bill, which at the time well, I think was the biggest tariff increase uh, at, in history at the time, uh, if not the biggest, one of the, the biggest. And so it wasn't at odd that the, what the man people call the, uh, the sort of the godfather of, uh, of free enterprise, uh, three months after his Sherman Act passed, that was named after him. He wasn't necessarily the main sponsor, but was named after him. Championed uh, protectionism, you know, the, some of the most extreme protectionism in, in the history of America uh, at that point. So I think it was all a fig leaf. I also I also expand on Murray Rothbard's work on uh, Herbert Hoover and what an interventionist he is. I tried to expand on it anyway, and uh, and most Americans are totally unaware of that. The average person out there believes this this uh, sort of uh, high school civics lesson that Herbert Hoover was an advocate of laissez-faire capitalism. That's what caused the Great Depression. FDR came to the rescue with massive <laughs> interventionism. Uh, naturally, uh, exactly the opposite is true, I think. Uh, if you look at what Hoover did, he made some great speeches. Pe the people in this room would probably think were great speeches after he was president. You read some of his, uh, his in his later years, he sounded great. Kind of like Ronald Reagan, his speeches sounded great, but, but when he was in office, wasn't so great. He was quite, quite the big interventionist. And, uh, and of course, I, I draw on the work of uh, Bob Higgs and uh, uh, Galloway and Vetter and others who have written about the Great Depression and to try to, in plain English, uh, write about, you know, what the, the FDR's policies of the Great Depression years did. And, uh, and the conclusion is they essentially made the Great Depression longer and more severe than it would otherwise have been, uh, in addition to massively politicizing the economy. And so I, I cover a lot of that, what I think is important ground, the energy crisis of the 70s. And I, and I end up uh, with a, a chapter on uh, current attacks on capitalism. And I do a couple of brief reviews of books by Roger, uh, not Roger Moore, oh, what's this guy, the fat guy, uh, Michael Moore. Michael. Roger Moore is James Bond. <laughs> Not James Bond. I like, I'm a big James Bond fan. Uh, Roger Moore. But, uh, uh, Michael Moore and, uh, uh, and Eric Schlosser and some of the more people who consider themselves sort of the, uh, the heirs to the uh, muckraking anti-capitalist journalists of the early 20th century. They, they call themselves, they, they like to compare themselves to Upton Sinclair, uh, who, uh, who was a propagandist for socialism. And, with the book The Jungle, you know, way back when. And it even says so on the back of Schlosser's book, Fast Food Nation, that he's, uh, he's sort of like the 21st century version of Upton St. Clair, uh, or, uh, or, uh, some others. And so I, I sort of take that on in, uh, in, uh, which is pretty easy because, uh, especially with Moore, um, uh, the things he writes in there, um, he's very popular, you know, New York Times bestseller all the time, every book he writes. And he says such things as uh, on unions, he looks at labor unions who negotiated with employers for temporary pay cuts to save their members' jobs. Literally save the members' jobs. The company did not go under. Uh, the, the economic crisis ended. The jobs were back there and the pay goes up. Those are sellouts uh, to him. And those are the, he calls them dumb. The name of the book is Stupid White Men. So those are the stupid white men, the one who saves the jobs of the, their own union members. The smart white men are the ones who maintained their belligerence and did not negotiate or renegotiate their contracts with their companies, and everyone gets laid off. Everyone lost their job. Those are the smart guys. And so, but but these are these are the kind of books that are being written 
and also uh, in colleges and universities, these are these are being used as uh, uh, every in most universities. All freshmen uh, are given the one one or two books to read during freshman orientation, and books like this are the kind of books that they're reading. And so I was, I was looking at mine as sort of an antidote to that. Uh, it, it, it won't be used much uh, as a replacement for these books because faculty committees are usually overwhelmingly run by leftists. Uh, but what, one of the things I found with my Lincoln book and one of the things Tom is finding out is, guess what? Students can read books without their professors telling them which books to read. And so a lot, a lot, of, a lot of students from all over the place are giving their professors a hard time with this stuff because they have ammunition. Uh, and they read books like this. And, uh, and they have ammunition now. So, the, so we're sort of in the uh, ammunition manufacturing business <laughs> in, in writing, writing these, these, uh, these books here. And maybe I'll stop there. That's all, uh, that's all the time I have for now. I'll just give a brief overview.